I apologize for this, but let's hope it works. Okay, um, let's talk about the pathway of electron transport. Um, the electron transport chain, which we did in our POGL yesterday, um, is in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. So the inner membrane, not the outer one. <laughs> I'm really bad at this. Okay, most of the chain's components consist of proteins, and those are going to exist in multi-protein complexes, which means there's going to be more than one protein. Multi-protein. Um, the carriers alternate both reduced and oxidized states as they finish accepting and they donate electrons, and then the electrons will drop in free energy as they go down the chain, and eventually that gets passed to O2, which is our final electron acceptor, and water is formed. So, don't feel like you need to know all of these because you don't. But this is what it looks like. Um, basically, the NADH will start at the top, it gives its electrons to the first electron acceptor, and then every time something is oxidized and reduced and oxidized and reduced as it goes through here, it generates energy and the two electrons that are finally released at the end are then, um, then bind with half an O2 or an O with, along with two hydrogens, thus creating H2O, two waters. So half O2 is a weird way to put it, but O2 is the way that it exists within the cell, so it exists as the gas. O2 bonded to each other, which gets split to create water, and that's why they put half O2, because oxygen doesn't really just hang out in the cell as one molecule of oxygen. So the electrons get transferred from NADH or the FDH2, both those high energy molecules, down the electron transport chain, and some of the proteins that they're passed through are called cytochromes, and they're called cytochromes because they have an iron atom in there. Um, and it does not generate, the electron transport chain itself does not generate ATP. But it breaks the large free energy uh, drop from food to oxygen into smaller steps. And each of those smaller steps releases energy in amounts that the cell can manage. P or something. Let's let's try it. Hmm. <gasps> Alt P. Oh, you <laughs> that means she can see me doing this. Okay. So, um, chemiosmosis is the process that is actually going to create the ATP. So all of the electrons that were transferred, remember the electrons and the hydrogens kind of, they go together, but as the electrons travel down the electron transport chain, the protons are pumped into the um, intermembrane space. So it's the protons moving back across the membrane through that protein ATP synthase that we saw in the video yesterday that um, that actually generates the ATP. So as the hydrogens flow through there, through the ATP synthase, energy is released, and that energy drives the phosphorylation of ATP, or ADP plus the inorganic phosphate yields ATP. And this is chemiosmosis, the use of energy in a hydrogen gradient, hydrogen ion gradient, and that drives the cellular work. So here is a picture of what's happening, and as you can see outside in the intermembrane space, you have the hydrogen ions, and they actually go through ATP synthase, causing the, I'm going to call it the top portion, but the part that's in the membrane to turn, um, and as it does, it, it generates enough energy for the inorganic phosphate to be bonded back to the ADP, giving us ATP. So here is essentially a picture of how this happens. In this section here, ooh, ooh, I can circle it, that's exciting. In this section here, we've got 
this is where our electron transport chain is occurring. So this yellow shows kind of the flow of electrons through here. And as the electrons go in, their hydrogen atoms get pumped out here into the into the um, into this intermembrane space here. And then all of the hydrogen atoms end up going to the end of the electron transport chain to this particular protein here, which is our ATP synthase. And the hydrogen atoms go through the ATP synthase. It's an exergonic reaction, so it releases the energy, which is then captured in the ATP. Um, and this portion right here is what we refer to as chemiosmosis. So together, the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis make up oxidative phosphorylation. So this is an example of how the of how the um, how the chemical reactions are coupled, because we've got a process that releases energy and a process that uh, that needs energy or absorbs the energy it takes it in. Uh, the the proton gradient or the H plus gradient, sometimes also referred to as proton, because remember a, a hydrogen ion with a positive charge is essentially a proton, is referred to as a proton motive force. Okay, and so the force gives it the capacity. We call it a proton motive force because that tells us that it has the capacity to do work. So any, any proton motive force would have the capacity to do work. So. If we were going to summarize what we have learned so far in this lecture, energy flows like this, glucose to NADH to the electron transport chain to the proton motive force and then is captured in ATP finally. 34% of the energy that's in our glucose molecule is transferred to ATP during cellular respiration, giving us approximately 32 ATP. But of course, you know that it's never actually 32. It can be more than 32, less than 32. If you're not using glucose, if you're using a different macromolecule like a lipid or a protein, those numbers could change. Um, and there are a bunch of reasons why the number of ATP is not known exactly, like the ones I just gave you. So here is a visual of how the whole thing goes. So you can take a second to look at that. Okay, so we've talked about cellular respiration. Now we're going to move on to fermentation, which is anaerobic respiration. So in anaerobic respiration, no oxygen is required. Without the presence of oxygen, the electron transport chain can't function because it doesn't have the final electron acceptor. And so glycolysis couples with fermentation, otherwise called anaerobic respiration, to produce ATP rather than coupling with that uh, oxidative phosphorylation process. Anaerobic respiration uses an electron transport chain, but the final acceptor is not oxygen. Sometimes sulfate can be a final um, electron acceptor. And fermentation is going to use substrate level phosphorylation instead of an electron transport chain. So remember that um, substrate level phosphorylation can generate ATP, just not in the same amount as, as um, the oxidative phosphorylation. So, fermentation, there are two main types, the alcohol fermentation and the lactic acid fermentation. I think they, those were in the pogo we did yesterday as well. So, in alcohol fermentation, pyruvate is converted to, al to ethanol, which is the same thing as ethyl alcohol, in two steps, and CO2 is released. And we can use this type of fermentation to brew things like beer or make wine, and it's also used in baking. So here is what this looks like. So do you have any questions on this diagram? So here's alcohol fermentation on the left. So as you can see, the glucose goes in and ethanol comes out. So this is what you would use for winemaking. But there's also this process where glucose goes in and lactate comes out. 
and lactate um, is produced because, see here, you're getting rid of CO2, and here there is no release of CO2. So that's the major difference. So in lactic acid fermentation, pyruvate is reduced to NADH, and it forms lactate. CO2 is not produced. Um, fungi and bacteria use lactic acid fermentation, and we capitalize on this to make cheese and yogurt. And of course, when you're human, muscle cells, when you're feeling that burn or the ache the day after you exercise, it's because you've already used up all of the oxygen available to your cells, and lactic acid is produced uh, instead of ATP. Yes, let's look at the previous picture. Oh, so the question was, um, is the lactic acid fermentation different because pyruvate is reduced to NADH? And if you look here, pyruvate, let's see. What is the big difference here? I don't think it's reduced both times because here's pyruvate well that's written strangely because here this is showing glucose yields pyruvate and the breakdown of glucose to pyruvate is going to give us 2 NADH which is the same thing that happens over here on this side so pyruvate itself would then be given the difference between the pyruvate and the lactate is this H, right? Do you see it here in this H? So these two hydrogens are given to the pyruvate. Over here, the CO2 is released, so these two hydrogens are given to this molecule, um, which yields ethanol. But I'm not certain why CO2 is released in this one and not in this one. It may just be whichever process is utilized by a particular organism. That's a good question. So if we're going to compare fermentation with anaerobic and aerobic respiration, um, glycolysis is used in all of them, which gives us two ATP. Um, NAD plus is used in all three, again, as the oxidizing agent. But the final electron acceptors are a little bit different. So in fermentation, pyruvate might be the final electron acceptor, or um, acetaldehyde, acetyl, a, it's aldehyde, acetaldehyde, that's a hard word to say. But anyway, could be used in fermentation, and in cellular respiration, oxygen is our final electron acceptor. Um, in cellular respiration, it's going to produce the greatest amount of ATP, so 32 is the number we're going with with this textbook and fermentation is going to produce two ATP per molecule. There are organisms that are obligate anaerobes, meaning they are obligated to carry out anaerobic fermentation or anaerobic respiration. They cannot survive in the presence of O2, but other organisms are what we call facultative anaerobes, so they can survive in the presence of oxygen and use oxygen for cellular respiration or without oxygen. So if you're a facultative anaerobe, pyruvate could take you into either a fermentation down a fermentation path road or into, uh, a, into an aerobic cellular respiration pathway. So this is an example. This is showing you how if you are facultative, pyruvate can follow this path to form ethanol, lactate, or other products, or it can follow this second path here to form um, to enter the mitochondrion and thereby producing our 32 or more ATP. So this is of an evolutionary significance because ancient prokaryotes were thought to use glycolysis before oxygen even existed in the atmosphere. So um, very little O2 was available until about 2.7 billion years ago, at which point there was a boom in the amount of 